Divine Truth Paget Messages Discussions Discussions of individual messages received by James Paget between 1914 and 1923 from large variety of spirits. This is Session 1, Part 1 of the discussion How Divine Love Enters the Human Soul, where Jesus and Mary discuss a message from Jesus given to James Paget on the 23rd of March, 1916, which is the first of two messages about how divine love enters the human soul and the differences between the soul and the spirit and physical bodies. The session was recorded on the 18th of July, 2017, from 12.20 p.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Divine Truth Channel. Today, I'm here with Jesus and we're going to be discussing a Paget message. So this was a channeled message received by James Paget in March 1916, and it was received from Jesus himself. So we're very fortunate to have Jesus here <laughs> to discuss his own message. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk through the message. Uh, we'll have Jesus, if he's happy to, read the message. <laughs> and then I've prepared some different points for discussion and some questions to ask you based on what's what's written in the message. Yeah. This is actually the first of two messages that you gave to Paget on basically based on how divine love is received into the soul. And so we're going to talk about this one and then in our next recording we'll talk about the second one. And then what we talk about in these two also forms a little bit of a basis or an introduction to an FAQ series that I'm preparing on the education in love assistance mm. groups. So yeah. we're sort of in a sequence here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of material we've prepared, haven't there, for this yes. year. And there's a lot of things we want to talk about, obviously. Um, but, you know, this is just the beginning of what we want to talk about. Just to remind everybody uh, about some of the basics, really. Yeah, isn't it? that's right, because there's a lot of sort of things that you've spoken about at length mm. in this message. but. I thought it's a great opportunity just to touch on all these things again because a lot of us haven't let it go of a lot of the erroneous or the wrong ideas that we have about what it is to be who we are, to yes. be a human and to and who God is and how we actually create that connection with God. Yes, so. and it has a large impact too. The message, this message we're discussing, have, has a large impact on the way in which we see ourselves the way we see our physical body in particular yeah. and the way we treat our physical body rather than the way we look after our soul. Yes. And so it's very important yeah. that we sort of understand the basics of the message really. Yeah. And so even though the title of this message is How Divine Love Enters the Soul of Man, you don't quite get really deep into that topic. Um, you touch on it by the end of this message. But in the second message that follows that, you go much yeah. more in depth. So. so this message is basically two parts. Yeah. One part given, I think, is a month or two after the first part or yeah. a few days after the first part. I can't remember exactly how long. <laughs> but uh, the, this particular first part does discuss a lot of basic principles where people have a tendency to get hooked up in their physicalness, if mm -hmm. you could call it that. And, and the metaphysical rather than focusing their real development on their soul. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So let's get into it. If you'd be happy to start reading the message. Sure. Sure. So I am here, Jesus. I am here according to promise and desire to write you on a subject that all men should be acquainted with, how the divine love enters into the soul of a man. As I've told you before, man is a creature of God having a body, spirit, and soul, and all these are necessary to make the perfect man. But these three parts of man are different in their characteristics and functions, and are separate and distinct, and have qualities that are unlike in their composition, as well as in the duration of their existence. The body, as you and all men know, has an existence which lasts only during the life of the mortal on earth, and after that life ends, dissolves into its elements, which no more can form the same body, either in the mortal world or in the spirit world, for these elements are merely things of matter, and may be and are used to form other bodies and manifestations of the material of nature, not necessarily in the form of human beings, 
for they enter into other forms, both animal and vegetable, and are so disseminated that never again will they become parts of a resurrected body. Your orthodox do not teach this truth, but think in some mysterious way that the mortal body will sometime be resurrected. Mm. Okay, so if we pause there, there's actually quite a lot in that first couple of paragraphs mm. just to touch on. Yeah. So the first part, if we go back to this, you, you introduce this idea of the three parts of a human, the mm -hmm. three parts of who we are. Mm. So briefly, what are the three parts of a human? Yeah, well, strictly speaking, although we terminate, we I use the terminology of the three parts of the human. Really, there is really only one part of the human. That's the actual soul itself, mm -hmm. of which each person is one half, and the body and the spirit bodies are basically attachments, if you like, to that soul. So the real being is the soul itself. And the bodies are physical manifestations of the soul in the universes in which they live. Mm -hmm. So as, they, as people would have learned in the third series of groups that we did last year in 2016, where we talked about God's understanding God's loving laws, they would understand that the soul itself is the core part of our existence. And the bodies are just ways that our soul, the half of the soul, can, be, can use these bodies to express itself in the different universes in which it's potential to exist. Mm -hmm. And so the physical body is required for the soul to ex half of the soul to express itself in the physical universe. And the spirit body is required for the half of the soul to express itself in the spirit universe. And uh, so that in that regard, we were talking to Paget when we we're talking to Paget about the basics about the formation of the human, we referred to the three parts, soul, spirit body, physical body. Yeah. yeah. And how does that, just briefly, how does that process of the three coming together occur? Yes, well, that's something that is uh, alluded to a little in this message, but uh, to be more exact than the message was able to be at the time, the way it comes together is quite simple, really, in that the unincarnated soul, of which there is two halves, both need to be incarnate in order to begin expressing and experiencing life. And you could say uh, God's designed it in such a way that the very first basic existence is our physical existence, where we learn um, a lot of things in our physical existence. And the incarnation process incarnates, uh, allows this connection to a physical body in order to connect to a physical existence and learn and experience things. And then the second phase of our learning, I suppose you could call it, uh, the second uh, phase of our, I would call it our, you know, uh, our childhood, mm -hmm. is, is really our spiritual existence. And that, and that needs a spirit body to, to engage that existence. Mm -hmm. Now, the physical body and the spirit body are material genetic structures. They are governed by a different set of laws. Uh, obviously, there are laws of the material, of the material world. And then there's laws governing the, phys the metaphysical or the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. And these laws govern the operational function of those two bodies. But the two bodies themselves genetically are created at the time of conception. Mm -hmm. and, and both the spirit, the spirit form and the physical form are created at the time of conception. And at the time of conception, once the uh, cell begin, begin to multiply, begin to divide, mm -hmm. and that's when the, the, the soul of the individual connects to that process and drives the life-changing process thereafter. Mm -hmm. the, the actual replication process and everything is supplied energy from the soul to those two forms. So in this particular message, well, I talked a bit about how the physical body encapsulates the spiritual body and that encapsulates the soul. The, the reality is actually the, the soul is connected to or encapsulates both the physical and spiritual forms because the soul, the governing energy of the soul, governs the, the way the, the two forms operate mm -hmm. or function. Mm -hmm. So is it fair to say that this point of conception, say where a man and woman make love they they conceive a child there's a genetic process that kicks off this cell replication yes and which is the same for all physical like for all mammals yes it's the same process so so the human physical form 
and the human spirit form is basically a mammal, mm -hmm. a highly developed mammal, of course, yep. um, that enables the soul, the true person, to connect and experience the worlds in which those two mammals, the t physical form and the spirit form, can exist. Yes. And so that's, that's distinct from, say, when dogs or possums reproduce, there's this other, they, there's a similarity. Yes, they, they have a physical form and a spirit form, but there is no soul providing the mm -hmm. energy or the, or, or the connectivity process to those two forms. And as a result, uh, you know, they don't have a abil ability to be self-aware mm -hmm. and to be free thinking, self-aware, have will, have desire. Those kind of things are driven more by what you would classify as instinctual processes, the yes. need to eat, the need to survive, the need to procreate and so yes. forth. So and we'll talk a little bit more about the um, unique gifts that uh, are possible for a soul, unique opportunities for beings that have a soul, mm. distinct from beings that don't. But I just wanted to clarify that basically the reproductive process is it's similar in terms of its very basic um, genetic coming together and changes, cell reproduction, the creation of a physical and a spirit body but it's only in the case of humans that a soul attaches. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So that's the, ma the main thing. There's other things that I'd like to mention in, in the second paragraph, for There's example. quite a bit that I've actually Is got. There? I'll, yeah. I'll wait till you finish <laughs> yeah. the second paragraph and we'll talk a bit more about the second paragraph because I just want to talk about the fact that there are different compositions uh, if you like, of the of the bodies and, and so forth as well. Yes. So I've got quite a number of questions about that. But Good just day. quickly, yep. before we move on to the second paragraph. So if the soul and spirit body attaches to the physical body at conception, yep. what are implications of this in certain cases? So there's a number of cases I'd like to ask you about. So if we start with in vitro fertilisation uh, practices, Yes, well, um, you can see straight away that there's many, what you would classify as medical procedures or practices um, that we gauge in, in modern human society that obviously are fraught with some issues regarding ethics and morality, uh, as well as issues regarding what actually physically occurs and why certain things physically occur as well. Mm -hmm. So with in vitro fertilisation, for example, and we've now got a, a process that's being managed outside of the human body in many cases mm -hmm. uh, where the conception process occurs, where the two bodies, the physical and the spiritual body, are created mm -hmm. and the replication process begins. Now, at that point in time, the, the young soul, the, the, un, the unincarnate soul, now becomes incarnated. So there is now one half of a full soul now incarnate into that and, and now connected to that particular fert fertility process. Mm -hmm. And this is why, you know, some fertilization attempts die is because obviously those souls haven't connected, the soul is not connected. Mm -hmm. And so naturally those particular attempts die off. Uh, so they're not able to sustain life. Mm -hmm. But if the soul does connect, now the, the, you could say that the soul is now connected to the fertile uh, egg and sperm combination, which is now ca causing the separation process, the division process to mm. begin to create the human from a genetical, from from the genetic uh, structure, and and now the soul is actually connected to that particular, to that particular form, the embryo, if you like, and now you could consider it to be individualized from that moment on. The problem, of course, with that is that uh, what we do with that medically. And what we often do with that medically is we, we store it, quite often freeze it, sometimes for many years. And during that period of time now, that little soul uh, is not connected to parents, mm. has, a, has, a, has uh, no awareness yet of what it, who it's going to be connected to. And it's almost like in a state of suspended animation without its own choice being, mm. being engaged. So just to clarify, if we backtrack a bit, just to summarise, basically with the process of in vitro fertilisation or in vitro practices, the, the egg of the woman and the sperm of the man are actually joined e external to a physical process and external to the, a physical body. Yeah, external the, to the mother, in other words. Yeah, yeah. Yep. They're taken out, 
join together, put back in the words. Yes, put back in and... And, um, and hopefully they take yes. is the, the yes. key with it connect to the womb's wall and connect to uh, have the ability to sustain growth. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then in some cases, as you were saying, there might be a couple of um, embryos, if you like, um, where the, the cell reproduction has started and embryo is frozen for a period of time. Yep. So just a bit of clarification on those two things. Basically, you're saying that once an embryo has created, which means that there has been a union between the, the cells in the sperm and eggs. Yes, and the replication process is now established. Established. You're saying that that embryo is has now a soul attached. It doesn't occur when it enters the womb of a woman. No. So, but obviously the embryo needs the womb of a woman to, because it's not possible to gestate a child outside of the womb of a woman. Not so, at the moment. Of course, in the future, with future medical changes, people may make that possible. To. Yeah. Hmm. But you're saying that the soul is attached at that moment that the embryo comes into being, not when it's in the womb of a woman. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So that, and and thereafter, we need to be, take care with our decision making, obviously, because from that moment on, you're making a decision for somebody else mm. who does not have the ability to tell you what they want. Yeah. But of course, God's designed instinctual things that they would want. And uh -huh. some of those instinctual things are love, compassion, consideration, sympathy yeah. and desire for, for them to uh, 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 live mm. and, and survive and thrive. Yeah. And these kind of things they would naturally receive from the emotional state of the parents yeah. under normal circumstances. But in the case of an embryo that's now in a stasis period, if you like, of its development before it's been implanted in the womb, it now does not have those things. Yeah. And so now there are ethical and moral things that need to be considered with regard to how we treat those mm. particular souls, if yeah. you like, that are now attached to those newly forming bodies. And this is where I see there's a lot of unethical choices made uh, and actually choices which later on result in the persons making these choices having to later compensate for them from God's perspective because every unloving choice we make naturally will result in, in a consequence of some kind that will correct it. Mm. Yep. Mm. And unfortunately, a lot of the choices made in this regard are all about addictions in many cases, like people need to, needing to have their own child, their own progeny, yeah. There are literally millions and millions of children on this planet who do not have parents or who do not have caring parents who could easily be given to another parent. Yeah. But because of our addictions of needing our own children and our own, uh, you know, guiding hand over those children, uh, and very frequently it means some level of ownership that parents try to express yeah. over children, and um, we have a lot of uh, distorted ideas about what uh, and also distorted ideas about medical procedures that we should be able to do in order to get one of these children yeah. for ourselves. Yeah. And a lot of money and time are, is actually placed into furthering these technological advances that enable these things to happen because they're so driven by this those emotions that you just referred to, these uh, sort of addictive kind of compulsive emotions within many men and women yes. that, about having your own children. Yes, and the, the addiction, addictive compulsion drives then a lot of unethical choices when it comes to the human soul. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of considerations to make if a person's considering in vitro fertilisation. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of alternatives they could have if they were truly caring about children yeah. um, rather than having to, to engage in vitro fertilisation. That, that being said, of course, um, there are strict controls governmentally worldwide about having another person look after your child and mm -hmm. having another person look after children is, a, is often looked down upon. Mm -hmm. So the whole concept of the human family is already distorted yeah. Uh, that causes these kind of problems uh, in, a, in lots of different ways. So, you know, if we didn't have a distorted view of the human family, we would have no trouble having a teenage pregnant girl, you know, having a child. And if she wanted to keep it, she would keep it and we'd help her keep it. And if, if she doesn't want to keep it, she wants to another parent because she doesn't feel up to keeping it. And there, no one would look down upon her for yeah. doing that. She's, she's making a decision in the best interest of the child. And... No one would look down upon the child or the parents who weren't the 
actual biological parents, as we call them, yeah. of the person. The reality is God is the biological parent of all human souls. Mm. And really, that's the only consideration that matters here. Yeah. It strikes me that there's because there's so many varying standards of what it is to treat a child well mm -hmm. globally amongst the human race, yes. um, that's why people get so uh, picky about children being almost raised in a community of if you if you were raised within a, a community or a society of people who had very similar if not same understanding of love ethics and morality then it, you would be safe to be raised by anyone wouldn't you and you wouldn't need yeah in practice i suppose that everyone's going to be in different uh, conditions of love mm -hmm. and you would certainly need to consider the condition of love of a prospective parent before a child is given to the parent yeah. to look after but at the end of the day um, having so much monetary things and other things and family things attached to it is where we run into a lot of strife mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so perhaps then we can just speak briefly about miscarriage and abortion mm -hmm. uh, based on some of the things that you've already spoken about about these emotions that exist within a lot of people about children and having their own children mm -hmm. um, so how what's occurring with miscarriage and abortion? What impact does that have upon a soul? Well, both uh, has quite a severe impact on the development of a child's soul once the, per once the child passes to the spirit world. God intended for a gradual development to occur and, and the, the physical process be a necessary part of that development. You know, so God's intention was to make every person have every person go through a developmental process that begins in the physical, mm -hmm. that ends up in the metaphysical or the spiritual body, and then that develops into some kind of soul awareness. And that was God's original intention. Now, obviously, if you take away a child through some, let's look at abortion, taking away a child from the ability for it to experience a physical life, now uh, its education is severely impacted upon and what I mean is it's life-based education, not the education that we receive at universities or schools here on earth, but rather God's life-based education is severely impacted upon. And this requires then a lot of care and consideration to be given to these children after they pass. Mm -hmm. Now, what is probably less understood is, um, you know, because uh, I think that's, to some extent there are, you know, so-called anti-abortionists and pro-abortionists on the planet, it seems. And, and the anti-abortionists, to some extent, understand that kind of stance in terms of the effect that it has on the child. Of course, they don't understand it from a spiritual perspective. They only understand it that you're preventing their physical life or physical existence. But there is a little bit of understanding there. But when it comes to um, the other aspect, which is the uh, you know, pregnancies that are terminated through the emotional state of the mothers and fathers, Mm -hmm. which are to do with, what do we call that, uh, um, not abortion, but uh, miscarriage. miscarriages. Yep. And when it comes to miscarriages, th there's very little understood as to why a child miscarri miscarriages, uh, the pregnancy miscarriages. And, and the reality is that there is a severe impact upon children of miscarriages as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the miscarriages are caused by the environment for the child that's now gestating in the womb being su such to so toxic emotionally mm -hmm. that the child miscarriages it can no longer or no longer wants to maintain its connection with its own physical form mm. and and this these kind of children too also experience uh, quite severe um, uh, restrictions of development in their first formative years up until quite often it's up to 30 or even 50 years of their life afterwards uh, are very slowly developing uh, mm -hmm. because of the poor start that they've had by not being able to ha be present in the physical form. Mm. Yeah. Now you mentioned um, so we're talking a little bit now about the causes of these things as we go through this discussion we'll talk about the effect because we'll talk a lot more about the soul and the different bodies and stuff. Sure. And so on. Yeah. But you just mentioned something there that I just thought would be good to um, touch upon. You said the woman's womb is so toxic. 
Now I can feel women everywhere who've had having miscarriages a lot of about that having topic. a fairly <laughs> hard time with that yeah. that statement. So perhaps you could just clarify a little bit more. Well, when you speak with, you know, which we do frequently, we speak to children that have been miscarried. The, there are very consistent signs that of the reason why they miscarried. Yeah. And in almost every case, it is a very strong demand of mother and or father or both parents mm -hmm. that this particular child fulfill a role in those parents' lives in some way. And this demand is so strong in those particular parents and so needy mm -hmm. that the children find the environment of the womb uh, unable, uh, uh, so difficult to maintain for themselves and their own enjoyment of life that they feel like they want to exit it. Would it be fair to say they don't feel it's a nurturing place to be? Well, it's certainly not a nurturing place. It, 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 as we know, on the planet, many men and women have quite strong and severe addictions to having children, mm -hmm. a lot of which have nothing to do with the desire to love and cherish a child, mm -hmm. but rather have a lot to do with their own personal needs and addictions. Yeah. And this is where the, these needs and addictions get projected upon the child. And unfortunately, because the child at this stage is basically just a feeling entity with very little intellect, mm -hmm. all it feels is a barrage of emotion uh, that, that is drawing upon their energy to such a point that their energy systems cannot even sustain life connected to the yeah. body, the physical body anymore, inside of the womb. Yeah. And that causes then the termination. Yeah. So by the child, if a miscarriage occurs, it's, it's because the child can no longer maintain its own energy connection with the two bodies that have been created anymore. Yeah. And that's due to the amount of energy that is being drawn from the the child's soul mm -hmm. uh, by usually the parents usually yeah. it's directly the parents and in particular the mother has a large part to play in that but both mothers and fathers have uh, have uh, bear responsibility for that particular those drawings of energy that yeah. occur in the for the child during, while it's in the womb yeah now many people don't want to hear that of course because they they then feel that basically i'm saying i'm blaming them for the miscarriage well, I'm not blaming them for the miscarriage because the emotions they have about why they need a child often came from their own childhood or yeah. their own prior experience. Yeah. And so it, it's, a, it's an epidemic uh, with the, within the human race, not necessarily within, uh, and also, of course, within the individuals who are having a child, but, but it comes from previous people in the human race, usually their own parents that have yeah. caused them to have these strong or high demands of a child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if I can just add, because I've spoken with some of these children who have been miscarried, mm. the predominant feeling they have is that they, they themselves, their unique personality is being rejected. Yes. There's a massive desire within the mother or both parents for a child but it's not for this unique person personality this this little person it's so that this person gives the mother and father something that they desperately want yes. and so what the child feels is a complete rejection of them and a complete feeling that they must fulfill the role some a role uh, or fulfill a need yes. in a parent and yes. therefore it feels very very difficult to remain yeah. yes so the, yeah. these children also find it very difficult to live in the spirit world in the initial phases of their life for the same reasons that an aborted child does, and that is they have not had the start that God intended for them to have, which is a, a long enough life in the physical form yeah. to, to actually learn many things about desire, will, and other spiritual aspects of our existence. And of course, that means that they then have to learn it or be taught it in their spirit state only. Mm. So we'll talk more about the fact that we go on to have a spirit life later in this message, but it does seem that, yeah, it just seems like a very um, intense uh, way to start your existence, doesn't it? These different ways that we've just discussed, and I know that's yes. why you wanted to raise them today. Yes, so because we have such a... Um, we, we, we have many 
uh, focus much focus on our physical existence more than we do our spiritual or soul-based existence and even a, par a parent who wants to desperately have a child is really just focusing on their physical existence mm -hmm. um, which which is a primary cause of many of these underlying problems that occur that then cause a lot of distress for others in in society and not only while they're here on earth it causes yeah. distress after they've passed mm -hmm. and if we understood fully the effects that it had then we would probably spend more time addressing the emotional things that cause these particular problems mm -hmm. and work through them so they no longer caused a problem mm -hmm. instead we want to blame someone else usually what we finish up doing is blaming god or blaming some imperfection in the so-called creation process or the evolution process or whatever else we want to refer to it as and we have a tendency to blame all these other things for the so-called unpredictable and and sad events that occur in our life particularly in relation to children and um and unfortunately because we don't understand we don't fix the problem and so the problem keeps reoccurring not only for ourselves but if we ever do manage to have a child it probably will keep recurring for that child as well in mm. its future because unless a, an emotion is actually released it has a, a long-term effect not only on this generation but on subsequent generations of people yeah yeah mm. okay so moving on a little bit then mm -hmm. you mentioned in this first paragraph that the body the physical body the spirit and the soul are different in their characteristics functions qualities and composition mm. which is quite a big statement in itself mm -hmm. Um, could you discuss how this is the case and why these differences are so significant to our spiritual development? Well, um, as uh, we would have learnt if you listened to group number three again, okay. the Understanding God's Loving Laws last year in the assistance groups, you'd realise that God has a whole heap of laws governing the universe. Now, some of these laws are specifically for the physical universe mm -hmm. and, and the material that is contained within the physical universe, of which the human body, the physical human body, is a part of. And the spirit uh, universes are also governed by a series of laws, and, and those particular laws also govern the spirit body and how that functions. And these laws are imposed upon the spirit body and the physical body as the soul is connected to it in a life form. And so, and also even after the death of the physical body, the death, uh, how the physical body decays is governed by these physical laws as well. Yep. Now, of course, each one has a different type. Every, every one of these types of uh, materials have different comp compositions and different sets of laws governing them. Mm -hmm. so, so you could think of it very much in a scientific manner, the way that it works, the physical body being controlled by physical laws, the spirit body being controlled by spirit laws, mm -hmm. and the soul being controlled by laws that are outside of those two universes. In the soul, as we talked about, the soul universe, another area, if you like, of, of the universe in a multidimensional universe, that controls the, the activities and functions of the soul itself. Mm -hmm. But the physical forms also are interesting in that the soul, being outside of the two physical universes, the spirit one and the physical universe, has the ability to communicate and function and also express itself through the bodies. So the soul also has a governing forces over these two bodies. Mm -hmm. The soul has an impact upon mm -hmm. how the laws that govern the physical and spiritual bodies. And uh, this is very important to understand. So it's not just the physical laws that govern the physical body, but rather the soul, its connection to the spirit body and its connection to the physical body governs also how the physical body functions. Yes. And we need to understand that it's not just the physical laws that determine how the physical body functions or does not function, mm -hmm. but rather the, the larger impact becomes how the spirit body and the soul that is behind the physical body actually draws those two things to it. So, so when, it, when, it, uh, when we look at this particular, uh, these particular issues, we can see now that, that how we see our physical body and, and its health and so forth needs to change its focus quite significantly in fact away from being physical centric which is the effect if you like of what happens mm -hmm. into what laws govern it and how the soul is affecting it mm 
Mm -hmm. And this becomes of primary importance. So we need to, although we need to understand that every one of these bodies is different in composition and different in duration and different in the way in which they can be utilized by the soul, the reality is that the soul does utilize them. And the soul, to a large extent, controls within the f laws governing each area, mm. the soul, to a large extent, controls what happens okay. to the physical body and the spirit body. Yes. So, so you're going to talk about that as we go through the message more and more, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And the, this relationship between the three the, bodies, if the you three like. Parts, <laughs> three, three, three parts. Three of parts of a man. Yes. Which is really just one part connected to two other forms to express itself. Isn't yes. It? And that's the critical thing, isn't mm. it? And you, really what you've just highlighted there is almost like a hierarchy of uh, laws and power over different laws. Yes. So the soul being the governing almost body. Yes. <laughs> uh, not a body, but uh, entity. And then that has an impact on the spirit and physical body laws. Yes. And you could say the soul's condition commingles with uh -huh. the physical laws mm -hmm. to determine what happens to the physical body. Yep. And you could say the soul's condition commingles with the spiritual laws yes. in order to determine what happens to the spirit body. So that's very interesting. I'm going to come back to that as we go through this because there's a few points in this message that I wanted to clarify, mm. but that commingling, that's quite interesting. Mm. Yeah. Mm. All right. So, but obviously what strikes me as we go through this message is that we and human beings in general, but even people who've listened to you teaching for years and years about this, basically what you've just said, we still really view ourselves as a physical being, being. Hmm. and that's evidenced through a lot of different aspects of our lifestyle yes yeah, it's, it's evidenced by our action isn't it by our action yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so for example some things i noted down uh collectively we spend immense amounts of time money and resources attempting to perfect our appearance yes our physical appearance um prolong and optimize the functioning of this physical body yes we're we're addicted to making it live as long as it possibly can <laughs> even when it's a wreck and and even when and it's it, it, it has received so much trauma yeah. that really it probably should pass yeah. but but we're so addicted to keeping the persons alive and keeping the persons here and so forth because we're so worried about what's going to happen in our future life obviously yeah. that that we in, end up sacrificing even the person's spiritual and emotional welfare yeah. for the fact to keep to keep them living and they're, they're not only their welfare but very often the welfare of others correct our whole wars are people are killing other people just to preserve their idea of what they want in their physical life all yes. kinds of different things yes and also, as you just alluded to, that we're terrified of death. Yes. And and my, it's funny how, you know, often with groups of people when we're talking, I talk to them about the terror of death and none of them would admit that they're terrified of death. They all think, oh, it's going to be okay when I die. Yeah. But the reality is their actions uh, demonstrate differently. Mm -hmm. Their actions prove that their whole life is, uh, is physically focused yeah. and therefore their whole life is really one of fear of what's going to happen after they pass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a huge issue, isn't it, where we are continually worrying about the physical and like how we look and how we feel and if we're gonna die and if our friends are gonna die and it's just, just it's a huge shift in focus, isn't it, to yeah. We know we don't really understand that we even have a spirit body, let alone a soul, if we're still living in that mindset. Yeah, that's right. So while a person may listen to a lot of spiritual talk about there being an existence after their current existence, and if you examine it, most of the world's most popular religions all feel that there is some life after your existence on Earth. So that being the case, most, you know, if you look at the seven and a bit billion people that are on the planet, more than five or six billion of those people generally say that they believe in some kind of idea or, or some kind of idea of life after death, and yet none of them act like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that means that their belief is really just an intellectual one. It's not something that touches their heart, mm -hmm. but rather just an intellectual concept 
that uh, that drives their actions. Mm. And often those intellectual concepts are even so flawed that it drives unloving actions. Yeah. And this is a big problem as well. So th there's a big problem with religion on the planet generally where it, where it supports um, belief systems that not only uh, do not honour the fact that we have an existence afterwards, but also do not honour the fact that any unloving behaviour on this in this existence will be corrected mm -hmm. in the existence afterwards. Mm. And if we knew those things uh, and believed it in our heart, we would make a lot more careful choices with our lives. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let's just go through just a few on-point questions sure. just surrounding that injury really of sure. going out. So, um, so we've discussed that the physical body is not who we are. Yes. Why then do we have a physical body? Well, as I mentioned, the physical body was created by God to give us the, uh, I suppose you could say, the experience of infancy. Mm -hmm. So the whole time we're here on this earth, maybe for the longest living person, it might be 100 or a bit longer years, this whole time we're living here is really our infancy. It's our inf We're an in infant in our development. And during that period of time, it gives us the ability to have many, many experiences. And in particular, when you think about it, it allows us to have many experiences surrounding the issues of love. So we have we, we come to discover what, you know, what love means and what love isn't and how sometimes things that are called love don't feel like love and mm -hmm. so forth. And we also discover other things that are important to our future development, such as will, how we use our will, desire, ethics, morality, and other very important spiritual aspects of our existence are actually uh, usually developed, you know, in the foundation of our existence here in our infancy while we're, while we're on earth. Also, this period of time gives us the ability to make adjustments without there being too much uh, pain in those adjustments. And when I say too much pain, I'm not referring to physical pain, but rather to emotional and spiritual pain that can result and be quite intense after we've passed if we don't make adjustments to our life while we're on Earth. So, so, so we have the ability in our life on Earth. It's a very merciful existence in a lot of ways. It has a, we have the ability to learn and discover things on Earth and make corrections of our mistakes and, and learn things. So by the time we arrive in our spiritual existence, our spirit body, we now are quite educated or have the capacity to be. Unfortunately, very few who arrive are actually educated at all, but we have the capacity to be educated. Mm -hmm. In addition, there's another thing that goes on, and that is when we go to sleep every night, we experience life in our spirit state. So that's a part of God educating us too about our next existence. Mm -hmm. And these particular things are an essential part of our development. Without these parts to our development, we would struggle to understand these kinds of principles and, uh, and see these kinds of principles in action. So there's a very good reason why God created the physical process initially, yeah. and then the spiritual process after that as well is also a developmental process that allows us to be further educated. And obviously, if we can be well educated in our spirit, in our physical life, to the point where entering the spirit life is is almost a non-event at all, mm -hmm. then of course that makes our spirit life experience educational, educationally, yeah. quite smooth and, and and easy as well. It's almost as if um, we're given this physical existence to start to learn some of the um, basic lessons of cause and effect yeah. and and very things that actually you see children starting to learn it, from a physical sense. But then as we learned in our third assistance group, which we keep mentioning, many of the physical laws are also leading us to understand higher spiritual laws of course. because there's a lot of um, parallels and symmetry in those those. And then, yeah, God has laws. created so many analogies in the spirit, in the yeah. physical state that actually refer to things in the spirit state as well. So that the beauty is we learn the physical life where it's not like it all gets thrown away once we pass no. uh, because there's a whole heap of things now we would know about the spirit life if we contemplated the, these physical things. So really you're saying that if we, if we are very aware uh, or, and very sincere in our physical body and our physical life, we start to be naturally led through the workings of the laws and we have towards these higher truths yes but also that you you touched upon the mercy of this in that that there is a it's it's a period where we have time to consider where some of the effects and the consequences are seemingly delayed or 
um, kind of dulled down in our awareness so mm. that we can grow in our sensitivity to what is actually occurring. So if we, we take sinful error-based actions, then we have these workings of a conscience, which I want to have a long discussion with you in a different time, mm. that can start to um, work upon us, but it's not as immediate, say, as something that might happen in our spirit life. Uh, or the uh, external environment is. Am I correct in saying? Well, this? Uh, well, I don't know if it's correct to say it's not as immediate because every one of God's laws, when broken, have an immediate effect. The the, the difference is the penalty associated mm. with the immediate effect is much uh, more merciful on earth than it is in the spirit world. So, an example of that would be if you broke a law in the spirit world and you did that on purpose you would uh, receive immediate consequences that are quite painful and uh, and you'd see the relationship between cause and effect quite frequently there. Of course, that also happens on Earth mm. if you're sensitive. Mm. But uh, unfortunately, many of us are not born sensitive because we have the detunement that's occurred by our parents. And so we have to learn or, or regain sensitivity in order to see the errors of our ways. And God doesn't uh, provide immediate penalties or punishment for those particular things that we don't see on earth. But in the spirit world, uh, because we've already had the experience on earth, there are immediate mm. consequences for the decisions we take. So you're saying, or what I take from what you're saying, is there's consequences no matter where we are. In and those are immediate no matter where we are. Immediate. But say, for example, in the spirit world, we might have physical restriction immediately placed Imposed. upon us. Whereas here in our physical form, primarily there's not a, well, as we know, we're walking around many of us who, who are willfully doing things that mm. are harming others, but we have this opportunity to correct, correct it. To observe, to, the, to do, observe the effects of our behaviour first yes. and observe, then to correct it. To learn, to regain sensitivity and to yeah. understand the working of our will. Yeah in that way. And unfortunately, the people on earth at the moment are not that clever at that, unfortunately, <laughs> because, you know, we can see uh, collectively we're doing a lot of damage to the environment, for example, and yet we're doing very, very little to repair. Yeah. And so that, that's an indication that none, we're not very good uh, as, a collect, co as a collective. We're not very good at determining what, what cause is and what effect is. Yeah. Um, but God's giving us ta a chance to do that yeah. by allowing us to, to, you know, do things that do damage the environment, for example, and then to see the results of the damage, the choices that we're making so that we can correct it. Now, he has to do that, uh, well, and he wanted to do that because he wanted to give us the gift of will, mm -hmm. the gift of free will and desire, the mm -hmm. ability to make choices and decisions based upon what we want but also seeing that he has laws in place that cause corrections if we want things that are bad for us mm -hmm. or if we want things that are not good for our body, not good for the environment and not good for our spiritual development too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yep. So, um, so we're talking a lot here about this physical body because in the message you said the body, as you, you and all men know, has an existence which lasts only during the life of the mortal on earth. Yes. But really what you've just said there is that that life of the mortal on earth in the physical body informs a lot of other things. It does. If we, if we desire to, to know it. Yes, like historically, for example, the physical body lasted 20 to 30 years. There, there were times in human history where the physical body was old, died of old age when you were less than 30. Mm. And that was because of the soul's development. And eventually we learnt to, to change certain behaviours and habits and change our eating, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, our eating desires and so forth and all these other things. And as a result of that, our, our lifespans become longer and longer. There's been less trauma. There's less wars, uh, ironically. Mm -hmm. You know, you might not think that's the case, but the reality is it, compared to the time when we were living 30, there was mm -hmm. much less, much everybody, a lot of people died then due to fights, you know, that ended up in, in death. And, and all of these things caused a degradation of the soul, which then affected the physical body and the longevity of a person's life. Mm -hmm. So historically, we came from living, you know, 20 to 30 years to now living close to 100 years yeah. for, for many people. 
And so you can see straight away that there had to have been some soul condition changes that have caused that based upon nobody wanting to live 30 years anymore <laughs> and seeing the effects of why they were only living 30 years, which had a lot to do with the choices that were making. Yeah. So then are you potentially saying that conversely, see, see what I notice is a lot of people are trying to prolong their life out of fear. Of course. Because they're afraid of that there is nothing. Well, they, they believe that, they, that it is nothing afterwards. But basically, you're saying we could actually have a loving desire to actually prolong our physical existence yes. so as to learn more. And, to, and, and if we had that loving desire, we could potentially extend our life. There's no reason why the human beyond. body is not capable of living a thousand years. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is that the cell replication process should occur mm -hmm. um, perfectly, but does not for mm -hmm. certain reasons. And we, if we discover those reasons yep. then and repair those particular reasons at the soul level, yep. then of course the human body is capable of living much longer mm -hmm. and, and only capable of living uh, longer under certain circumstances. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, what's going to happen is if we do development physically, we'll get to a point where we've extended our physical lives to the point where we can't extend them anymore. Mm -hmm. And unless we do the soul development work, the, the spiritual work, if you like, that's yeah. required, um, we won't be able to extend our lives beyond that period of time. But, but in the future, um, decisions may be made by humanity collectively and individuals personally. To, to choose to, to do this developmental work mm -hmm. that would result in the physical body lasting a lot longer than what we're used to at the moment. Mm. Yep. Yeah, very interesting. Yep. Okay, so if our physical body is not who we are, mm -hmm. if, it's not, if my physical body is not who I am, mm -hmm. why then do I feel so acutely that it is who I am? Why do I feel everything in my body so much and why does it feel like me? Well, for a start, when we say we feel everything in our physical body so much, most of the time we're referring to pain, <laughs> a lot of the times there, aren't we? And the reality is pain comes from these other aspects of our existence, which is uh, our choices ethically, morally, and also our choices with regard to love and our understandings of love. And these are the things that cause pain and disease and death in the long run in our physical form. So naturally, every time we're out of harmony with love, our physical body is going to respond to that. Mm -hmm. So naturally, we're going to feel our physical body quite, you know, quite heightened degree under those circumstances yeah. because it's causing us pain and we have a tendency uh, to be very responsive to pain, <laughs> and particularly physical pain and less so emotional pain, unfortunately. But we have a, we're, since we're responsive to it, we now want to try to cure it. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, though, we, because we're still detuned from the concept or idea that we are a spiritual being and have a soul-based existence, we are not trying to cure the soul. We're trying to cure the effect of the soul upon the body. And so we're not very successful at yeah. cures, except when they're medically intervened, mm -hmm. where, where, where we do medical interventions. But even those have very little long-term, when I say long-term, greater than a hundred year benefit to us. Mm -hmm. so, so that is one aspect, this aspect of like pain that causes us to be uh, detuned. Now, also, because we're quite desensitized uh, emotionally and spiritually, we also have a tendency to focus on pleasure at all costs. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that means pleasure for the body at all costs. So, for example, we find that for many of us, we get a lot of pleasure from eating. So what do we do? We overfeed, we, you know, mm -hmm. we, and eventually we get fat. And now our body's in pain because we've overeaten. Eaten, yep. And our body's now reflecting the fact that there is a problem emotionally that we need to cure. So we stop overeating and have the potential to reduce our size. That's an example. Sexuality is another example where we use sexuality in an animalistic manner. Mm -hmm. uh, where we're focused on just sort of satisfying the sexual animal mm -hmm. rather than considering the moral or ethical uh, parts of sexuality. And as a result of that, we engage in behaviour that eventually causes us to get sexually transmitted diseases and so forth, which then limits our ability to enjoy sex mm -hmm. and so forth. So there you're talking about almost the physical body as a barometer or a measure and an indicator of what's going on spiritually and in our soul. Yes. Um, you're also talking about it almost as a limiting, a limiter, 
like uh, I get ill because I'm so that limits my life. I get a disease, so that which is actually my life. a good thing if you think mm -hmm. about it, because it, by limiting my life, it's telling me something's wrong. Yeah, and by telling me something's wrong, there's a higher likelihood that I will at least intellectually, at some point, become aware that there's something wrong that I need to correct. Yeah. And if I did not have that limiting factor, I'd probably continue the yes. sort of uh, this. You could take the analogy from, say, putting your hand on a hot stove. Yeah. If there was no pain associated with putting your hand on the hot stove, eventually your hand would burn away and you still wouldn't know that it's happening. Yeah. Right. Which you could see, which if means you weren't looking. Yeah. yeah. If you weren't looking and that you would lose the ability to use the limb. Mm -hmm. um, because you weren't, there was no pain to tell you that actually, no, you were now exceeding the boundaries of what this particular limb was designed for. Yes. Right. And really all of the pain that occurs in our body is that it, it, it is God attempting to show us that we're exceeding the boundaries of its design. Mm -hmm. We're attempting to, mm -hmm. and there's going to be a consequence associated mm -hmm. with that attempting mm -hmm. uh, that attempt to exceed the boundaries of the design, the technical design of the body itself. Yeah, mm. yeah. I suppose there's another aspect that I was thinking about as well, which is um, how I, I suppose for a lot of my life, I've felt very disconnected even from my physical body. Um, and as I become more sensitive emotionally, is really what I'm talking about, but um, I start to become more aware of even my physical body. So it does feel like my body and my emotions are quite connected. So things like I feel tension in my neck when I'm stressed. I'm afraid. So that's, that's a pain-based one. But also when there's emotion flowing, I feel sensations in my body. And mm -hmm. when I'm going to cry, I feel a tightness in my neck until I cry, release it. Um, and then it disappears. It disappears. Uh, there's sexual sensations. There's different. So it seems to me that it's, it is hard if I was to just listen to our discussion and say, Oh, well, the physical, because you say very clearly all through this message that we're only still in the first paragraph, yeah. but <laughs> that the physical body is not who you are. Yeah. And yet um, it's quite an exciting process for me to start to experience my physical body. Mm -hmm. But also uh, it would be very hard. I would find it distressing now if I read this message and I had to go, oh, well, this physical body, well, that's not even it. You know, I, I've been doing all this work and now this physical body's not even it. I've got to just sort that's of That's really not the that. message you're saying, though, is it? No. no. That's, so I just wanted to really yeah. um, draw that out. Because the message the is really saying that God created our physical existence for a purpose, yeah. spiritual existence for a purpose. We have the ability to be sensitive to that purpose or not. When the more sensitive you are to the purpose, the more harmony there's going to you're probably going to personally want to have with that purpose, mm -hmm. and therefore have more joy in engaging your physical life in that in that role. Yeah. Um, but the other aspect of it all is that most of us are so physically centric and yes. so afraid of anything afterwards that we're willing to even kill people mm -hmm. to prevent our own death, and as a result of that do not understand the consequences of such behavior yeah. and this is a big problem yeah. uh, and that's a big problem uh, it's a big problem for humanity it's been the major cause of all of our wars mm -hmm. and uh, it's a big problem for the happiness that occurs in our physical existence yeah. for many many people they are desperately unhappy even today if you had to ask the seven and a, and a half billion people on the planet whether they're really happy there wouldn't be very many people who would be able to uh, honor, uh, you know, honestly answer and say, look, I'm really happy. I've been happy for the whole of last year or something yeah. like that, you know, yeah. Yeah. because there is so many negative things that are occurring on the planet, so many negative things occurring in our personal lives as a result of us not knowing the relationship between mm -hmm. the soul, the spirit body and the physical body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not a matter yeah. of... Um denying or um no sort of it's a matter of connecting yeah. but understanding the importance yes so it's, it's very important to remain connected the soul to remain connected to its physical and spiritual body for as long as it can sustain those connections but but we need to understand their relative importance hmm. it's no good holding on to the connection of the physical body because we're afraid of anything else afterwards 
and thereby preventing our further development. Yeah. That's not you know, yeah. that's not wise either. So we need to have a balanced view yeah. of the entire thing. And what I notice for for I do see it's pr especially for women on the planet mm -hmm. uh, at the moment is that their physical body is seen as a measure of their worth and their value and yeah, I think it's the same for men and women to a large degree. Um, we're evaluated mm. often by our physical appearance. Yeah. And, um, and it, there's no consideration given to historical previous choices by previous generations mm -hmm. that have impacted upon our physical appearance. Mm -hmm. You know, God designed everyone to be pretty in some way, yeah. but, uh, you know, unique but, but pretty but beautiful. and beautiful. Yeah. Uh, the reality is that most of us are not like that, mm -hmm. but that's often not just our own fault. Mm -hmm. It's often the fault of many generations, in many cases, hundreds or even thousands of generations of people making choices mm -hmm. that have degraded the genetic condition of the human form. Mm -hmm. And uh, historically, as I've said, there's a degradation that occurred right down to the fact that most people were ugly and lived less than 30. And now we're in a slow, uh, very slow at this stage, unfortunately, but we're in a slow period of progression. Yeah. But, uh, but that progression is going to be very dependent upon us realising what causes progression. Yeah. And at yeah. this stage, not many people on the planet know yes. what truly causes progression, progression in the human race. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, my goodness, there's just so much to talk about. <laughs> Can I raise one other issue here about the resurrection teaching? That, or are you going to ask about that, that next was, week? Yeah. We ask away. <laughs> ask away. So all three major religious teachings on earth, so Judaism, Islam and Christianity. Yeah. All I'll say there's more major than that. There's Sorry. Buddhism and Hinduism yeah. and other religions too, Taoism and so forth. Well, but these particular ones that are Judaistic or, or based upon the Abra Abrahamic history. Yes, they have their origins in the same place. <laughs> exactly. Yes, that's yeah. a better way to yeah. say it. They all have teachings uh, within them which which talk about a judgment day and the resurrection of the physical body. In And there's various interpretations, but basically it exists within those three t teachings. Yes. Um, so and the interpretations is, now are quite wide because obviously they're trying to incorporate scientific understandings into those interpretations yeah. whereas he, hundreds of years ago and when we wrote this message they hadn't discovered many of the things about the human genome for example and so forth no. and so you know yeah. there, there was even more traditional physical explanation of a physical body resurrection yes. than there is now and it being the same body yes. and in your message to Paget, you said um you talked about how the the body breaks down elementally, which we we'll talk about in a minute. You know, yeah, yeah we talk yeah. about again even. Yeah. Um, but you say, and that that it it never again becomes a part of a resurrected body. Your orthodox do not teach this truth, and I would have to say on earth today, still the orthodox of all of those religions do not teach, do the, not truth. teach no. the truth. So how does that affect? <clears throat> I think we've already kind of answered it, but how does it affect? the world the fact that these well this is the trouble with uh, religious teachings that are based on scientific falsehood mm -hmm. like, in other words they're not scientific at all though they're, they're, ba they're based not based on scientific truth they're based on people's imaginations frequently they come from uh, uh, people's imaginations historically mm -hmm. that have been passed down generationally with slight modifications to to accept the basic scientific discoveries of the day unfortunately um Religion generally hasn't kept up with the scientific <laughs> discoveries of the day, and as a result, most religion nowadays has quite un, is quite unscientific in much of its uh, premises that yeah. it presents to its adherents. So, so the real problem here is that is that for most of these religions, and this applies to all religions now, not just to the the ones that come from the Abrahamic, uh, Abrahamic mm -hmm. history, mm -hmm. but also other religions are all created using these same kind of methods where they don't get updated scientifically and they're not they're not uh, in harmony with scientific truths yeah. and as a result of that there are huge numbers of people who make decisions and if you think about those particular the christian faith the muslim faith and the jew jewish faith for example mm -hmm. and these are just examples we're choosing now and if you think about how many times they have justified war yeah. Right, for the purpose of extension of their to. faith 
and they continue to justify war, mm -hmm. war all three for the, all three yeah. for the purpose of the protection of their faith mm -hmm. now you can see straight away that that is a major problem and you've got to question the real faith of these religious people in these faiths who justify war mm. because if they if they truly had any faith in an afterlife a proper existence after this one you you would think they wouldn't justify war why would you think that well, because they would be focused on the benefits that would arise out of their new existence after they have died anyway, mm. rather than focusing on doing something that is obviously quite damaging to people, mm. that obviously is out of harmony with love and quite clearly can be demonstrated to be out of harmony with love mm. and yet still engage, self-righteously engage that behaviour in order to survive. Yeah, I suppose there's certain teachings within each even pertaining to your death, this idea of martyrdom yes. in Islam and in Christianity is viewed as something that's quite heroic and you get your rewards in the afterlife. And nothing could be further than the truth. Yeah. Martyrdom has to apply only... A true martyr who actually gets a reward in, this, in the new life, in the spirit life, mm -hmm. it has to be a martyr for the sake of love, not for the sake of um, unloving of action. Yeah. And and war is a, is a... might You might justify it as a love of your brother here yeah. while at the same time killing another brother over there and that obviously is not love yeah. and therefore it require it naturally requires a degradation of the soul to occur under god's laws and and therefore negative consequences and, and so you know unfortunately because of some of these false beliefs yeah of religions based upon not understanding even the soul and how it works mm. um, they encourage behavior that that actually causes the degradation of the human condition yeah. in the physical form because mm. naturally war does cause degradation of human condition anybody who's been in a war-torn zone knows yeah. that it's very hard to create in a war-torn zone it's very hard to be happy in a war-torn zone it's very hard Absolutely. to be fed it's very hard to be watered even it's yeah. very hard to have any sense yeah. of it, it, like a nice, or, yeah. st stable, fearless life yeah. in a war-torn zone. And there's plenty of evidence that shows that any war is obviously wrong. Mm -hmm. And yet the human, you know, and, and many human religions mm -hmm. promote it still. Yeah. And if not promote it, certainly support it under certain certain conditions. Yeah. And, and obviously it's wrong. Yeah. But, uh, but unfortunately we continue doing it because of belief systems mm -hmm. that are completely false that uh, and because we haven't understood the truth about how the soul is even created yes and if we go back to this idea that um of the resurrection of the physical body mm -hmm. so basically this idea that it it will be this same body that it, that's you yeah, well, not is, all really the... not all religions say that now anymore you right. know some say it will be this same body mm -hmm. some say well it can't be the material of the same body but it genetically can be the same which is probably more scientifically truthful i see yes like <laughs> um, a clone almost. so like a clone yeah, yeah. of it yeah. um so that you recognize yourself and so forth um yeah, so that there are a number of different theories that, or interpretations now that yeah. have developed as a result of these teachings. Of course, uh, the, the physical body, if it was created again by God, and I say if it was because it's not going to be, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the physical body is created through a process of yes. genetic commingling. Yes. And that genetic commingling has to occur, whether it's in a test tube or in a human, yeah. you know, yeah. in the woman's womb, it has to occur in order for it to for for a physical body to be created yeah. and no other way will god create a physical body in fact in the future and the reason why is quite clear and that is god never as we learnt in our third group never does something that's uneconomical yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he's already created the means by which the human race have the ability to continue survival and uh, and he's not going to change those means just because some imagination of some person develops a religious concept or idea that has some alternative. Yeah. And, and so the whole idea of a resurrection of the same body is completely impossible, as we can mm -hmm. see, because 
the elements that comprise the body you're in now mm -hmm. even aren't the same elements that they were 10 years ago, let alone when you die. When you die, then this body is no longer connected to your soul. The body itself begins a process of, uh, of um, the decomposition, decomposition yeah. which then results in uh, it, the elements within the body being in lots of different things, animals, you know, the earth, yeah. plants, and lots of other, even in the air, yes. you know, yeah. and uh, and so you know, putting all those elements back together again is an unnecessary thing to do from yeah. God's perspective. So, if if this human body does dissolve in this way and returns to elements, what is actually the best way that we could dispose of a human body after? Well, that's a good question, really, isn't it? Like, yeah. how do we go about disposing a body? Well, obviously. You want to dispose in anything, uh, you know, anything you dispose, you want to have it the best, having the best benefit to the environment. Now, burning it does not have as good a benefit to the environment as burying it. Yep. The reason why is burying it now, it can supply its moisture and elements back to the ground, back to the soil, and now those things could be reused and reused much in a much better form mm -hmm. than if you say burnt it. And I suppose the carbon and things, when you burn a body, would re-enter into the atmosphere, would they? Along with other elements yeah. too. But yeah. but there are lots of parts of the elements that can't survive the burning. You yes. know, any moisture-based elements yeah. obviously don't survive the burning and therefore have little benefit. Mm. And so you're better off burying the body if you want to mm. look at it from well, God's perspective than you are burning it. Yes. And, and you wouldn't care either way because yeah. it's not yours anymore not anyway. Yours. <laughs> <laughs> so you wouldn't care how it was used. Yeah. Um, Mind you, well, you also would consider how the organs are used because uh, obviously if it can sustain another person's life, then why would you not donate yes. um, your organs? There's no reason why you would not donate your organs where somebody could use your eye if it's any good. Mine are not that good at the moment. When <laughs> they improve, it might be better. But, you know, your liver, your kidneys, <laughs> you know, any part of your body could be reused. There's no reason why it cannot. Of yeah. course, there are things to do with that as well that affect the ability for people to be able to use it under a law-based circumstance. In other words, the body has limitations mm -hmm. as to what kind of elements it can be attached to it. Yes. and those elements survive. And man has learnt some of those limitations. Yes. So you're talking there about blood groups and Correct. things like that. Yeah. Not only blood groups, but also things like, you know, um, what happens to, you know, some of the belief systems also that, that affect how the person reacts after they've received <laughs> elements of the body. Yes, so, so <laughs> let me just, just summarise what we said earlier sure, and then sure. I'll have some other things to talk to you sure. about. So we talked about the best way to dispose of a body is to to put it in a situation where the elements it's composed of will have the most use, the most benefit to the other living creatures, creatures on, on the, Earth on, and living systems on yes. the Earth. So obviously now, the most important of those living creatures are humans. So let's yes. firstly use the organs that those humans need to to continue their life, yep. if that's possible, yep. and anything that's left over. Yep. In the ground, so that uh, so that the animals and the birds and the and the insects and the un and the sub crustacean yep. yeah. <laughs> uh, creatures and whatever you know, worms and all those things can can utilize them and convert them into things that they need for food. Now, obviously, when we have rows and rows and rows and rows and rows of tombstones in a cemetery, I can think of better places. You of know course. my opinion about where I'd. Well, like this to is be, the thing where law gets. You yeah. know, we're so oh, scared of death and fascinated by it, and we want a place where we go and remember the person. Yeah. I understand that, but but the reality is, and um, pl planting, if we can call it that, the body yeah. in a in in a long line of tombstones without you know creating a beautiful garden above it yeah. uh, is pretty pointless. If it was a beautiful garden above it, then that would make sense because because yes. the beautiful garden could feed on those bodies and and support and support a lot of life. And you could yeah. still have the tombstones in amongst the if you wanted gardens, to, yeah, if, you if you needed you to. to go and remember the person. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, you could. Yeah. But you know, we're we're so uh, uptight about our body and what's going to happen after we die that generally we don't use it very well well i mean and this is like cultures throughout the world see the 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 um like even the bone is it something sacred it's something and that's 
due really to the attachment still again isn't it upon the, the yeah. idea that the physical body is who we are well every religious human life i do think feel is human life is, is but every so. ritualistic belief in any religious form is usually based upon some fear mm. that a person has which then is in then is imposed upon that religious form mm -hmm that then a person must live by and that's where it gets dangerous because people are willing to die for that even mm. and that's that's ludicrous you know mm. like to die for a person that's already dead yeah. or to maintain you know how a body of somebody who's already dead is used yeah. is is a ludicrous concept yeah. considering that the body is just now material yeah. that is going to decompose anyway mm. yeah, well i went to university and studied anatomy and physiology mm -hmm. and some lovely people had donated their bodies to science and I got to actually um, examine bodies, cadavers yeah. and parts of human bodies to learn muscles and tendons and nerves and and that and that was an amazing experience for me to, yes. to see the human body inside of us how we are it's a fascinating miracle of life yeah. uh, workings to, yeah. to have that opportunity and yeah so that's another good way of using your body isn't it yes. obviously for the education of the next generation of people yes obviously a powerful way to use your body yeah 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 and you touched on organ transplant and mm -hmm. donation yeah. and and you touched upon you know obviously we're learning more about the laws that govern that from a physical perspective yes but also let's just talk a little bit about how our belief systems um, interfere with it interfere with it <laughs> yes. and the different spiritual aspects of that yes so it's interesting, uh, usually when a part of our body dies, you know, whether it be a liver or a kidney or some other part, there's usually been due to some trauma or due to some physical ailment that's generated because of an energy blockage in our soul and our spirit body. Mm -hmm. As a result, our, that part of the body dies. Now we need a replacement, obviously, mm -hmm. if we're going to continue living. And this is and only for some organs is that possible yeah of course only for some yeah, is yeah, it possible yeah. you know obviously it's yeah. possible for the eye or the cornea yeah. and it's possible for the, the heart. heart even and the, the liver kidneys. and the kidneys but the lungs yeah. would be very difficult to achieve i think it but does some occur. have tried that the heart occur. lung yeah. transplants yeah. 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 very complicated yes. op operations and but other parts are obviously uh, you know less less yeah. viable yeah but the parts that are viable, unfortunately, because of belief systems of the person who died, that person is frequently quite attached to their bits of their body that is now being <laughs> distributed. Well, especially <laughs> if they have this idea that that's who they are. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And they're quite attached to the bits of the body that are being distributed amongst other people. Now, as a result of that, they have a tendency to influence those other people in their decision making choices and even in um, things like whether the body can sustain that new replacement part. Mm -hmm. so, so now we have the belief system of the past person mm -hmm. because they have been, have been physical body centric. Yeah. Now worrying about or being concerned about yeah. how their body part is now being used in the new person. Yes. And frequently they do impact upon that person that has received the transplant. And there's a whole lot of documented cases of that occurring from rejection of organs that shouldn't be rejected. Mm -hmm. Right the through, way through to things like um, them now having a new taste sensation, you know, where they now feel like they've got to eat, you know, they love oranges now and they yeah. didn't before or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Some, some change, some psychological change occurring within the person once they received the transplanted organ. Mm -hmm. And this all occurs because of the connectiveness between the person who's passed and whose body the per bits the person has received. <laughs> And um, on us who's still alive has received those body bits and they're now being influenced by the person because of the person's attachment to their body. Yeah, so, and, and that's the, the person now in their spirit form yes. still feeling like that's me. That's my body. That's me, that's a part of me. I, I'm and, and gravitating towards those parts. Those parts, gravitating towards the earth, gravitating towards those parts, and then basically having an influence and we'll talk more about how the senses work in a minute, yeah. but an influence on the person who now has their, say, their kidney, liver, heart, or whatever they have, yes. any one yes. of their organs. Yeah. Now, naturally, that means then that the person who received the body part has 
a degree of influence upon them that they never had before, yeah. which sometimes causes them to take actions yeah. uh, that were different to the actions they would normally have taken. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah. That's a, it's an interesting thing, hey? Yes. Yeah. And you can see when you examine it from a spiritual sense and you watch it occurring, you can see these little attachments forming. Some of them are not uh, what you'd call malicious. They're just more an interest or a yeah. fascination in the new person that has a bit of their body. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and a desire to somehow influence that person's life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah.